Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me, and now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. Right. All right. All right. Welcome everybody right. to another cloud computing career Q and a session from us at go cloud careers. My name is Chris Johnson and you can't see that cause I have that turned off. There we go. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the chief operating officer here at go cloud careers. As always, I'm joined by Mike Gibbs, our founder and CEO and Alonzo Coleman, our chief marketing officer. And we are here to take and answer any of your cloud computing career questions, whether you've got questions about the cloud architect job, the 
cloud engineer job, cloud architect training, cloud engineer training, or you just want to know what cloud computing is. And you're like me a year ago and don't know what cloud computing is because I'm a business guy. I'm an operations guy. Mike and, Mike and Alonzo are my tech people. I'm the business guy. So if you just if you just want to know what cloud computing is or the cloud architect job is or you know you've seen terms like AWS cloud computing or Azure cloud computing this is the place for you if you're if you think you might be interested in a cloud computing career this is where you can ask your question so if you want to know what is cloud computing what is a cloud architect what's a cloud engineer anything about cloud architect jobs or cloud engineer jobs let us know. We want to help you. We want to help you on your path to becoming uh, whatever it is that you want to become. We want to make you make your path as easy as possible. So make sure you ask us your questions. It never fails that people wait until absolutely the last minute or I've gotten smart. I threaten that we're going to leave and then everybody starts to ask their questions. So don't make me threaten to leave to get people to ask questions. Just ask us your questions. We're on LinkedIn. We're on YouTube. We're everywhere so that we can answer your questions. Um, so before we get started, I want to uh, make sure everybody is aware of a couple of things. Uh, just making sure I've got everything here. So we have a webinar tonight. Tyrone, can you put the link for our interview webinar, our secrets to winning the interview webinar? Uh, can you put that link in the chat box for us? This will be at 6 p.m. tonight, four hours from now, 6 p.m. Eastern time. If you want to know how to win the interview, if you want to hear how we help so many people improve on their interviews and prepare for the interviews and win the interview, join this webinar. It's completely free. No, you don't have to do anything. Just show up. Um, well, you got to register and then you show up, <laughs> but, but other than that, that's all you got to do. Uh, come in here, come in here. What we've got to share with you, come and ask us your questions. It's going to be on zoom. So you can come off mute and ask us questions. Make sure to sign up for that. Tyrone's just put that in the chat box. Uh, the other thing that I want to make sure everybody is aware of, we've got a free interview guide also to go right alongside this. And why are we emphasizing interviews? So many people. So many people spend so much time, effort, and energy learning the skills for the job that they don't prepare for the interview. And if you're not prepared for the interview, then the likelihood that you're going to get the job that you spent all this time, effort, and energy on is very small. So prepare for the interview. So get this free resource. It's a completely free guide, completely free webinar. Tyrone's got the links for both of those in the chat box. I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of those because we've got that going on tonight and I don't want you to miss it. It's completely free for you. So before we get started with some questions, Mike and Alonzo, you've got any, anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. The key is I want everyone to have a career that they absolutely love. And, you know, I've been an architect now for 25 years, whether that be a business architect, enterprise architect, network architect, you name it. If it's an architect job, I've done it. And, you know, one of the biggest things that really upsets me is there's so many good people out there, smart people out there that really want a great job. And they train and they train and they train hard and they put in a lot of effort, but they learn all the wrong things. And in the end, they go on an interview and they get told the youth and they, get, they don't get hired. And when we, we, when we hiring managers interview someone, it's because we're willing to hire them. And then if someone does not a good job on the interview, we say, come back when you have more experience. And I hate that. I hate that. Every day I get people jobs with no experience. Whether it's Ivan Tamb at AWS, who was a college student working as a waiter, whether it was Coyote, another college student that AWS hired as a solution architect, they're all hired as architects, by the way, or whether it was uh, Jordan Kitko who got hired by AWS, all college students know experience completely hired because we trained them and they had the right skills. Or whether it was Balwinder who was hired as a and she was a stay-at-home mom, or whether it was Jennifer Ema, who was a mental health tech hired by J.P. Morgan Chase, or whether it was Noah Parker, who was a social worker who got his first solutions architect job, or Raymond, who was selling perfume, who just got his first solutions architect job. The point is, any of you can do it if you have the right training or the right preparation and the right skills. So most people misunderstand the cloud architect role. They confuse it with the cloud engineer. They develop all the wrong skills. They work so hard, and in the end, 
they can't get hired because they don't have the skills. And I don't want that to happen to you. Uh, I had a secret in the beginning of my career, and it changed my perspective. There are about 20 of us that all wanted to go into networking at the same time, and we were all friends. And we all took this 10-day, $11,000 CCNP boot camp. We became even closer friends. And in the end, nobody got a job because every skill they taught us was the wrong skill. We had certifications out the wazoo, but nobody cared. And when I finally got my first job, I asked the VP of architecture, what's it going to take to be the best network architect you have? And he said, thank you for asking me this. And he gave me a set of skills. And I learned those set of skills. It was a principal architect practically overnight. And then I moved up in the ranks. And I've helped, spent 20 years now helping people become architects, engineers, leaders, managers, whatever job they wanted. And it's all about knowing what the hiring manager wants. I've spoken to thousands of hiring managers, thousands of executive leaders over the years, thousands of recruiters. And I know exactly the skills that you need for your tech careers. And I want to help you. So ask us your questions. I see there's already some questions and I want to help you. But ask us your questions so you don't have to wander around aimlessly. I don't want you to just do what, 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 what I did, which is ask people that didn't know themselves. We were all trying to train. And you know what we knew about these careers? Nothing. And what did we do? We made a lot of mistakes. And it took time, effort, and money. Average cloud architect earns $818 a day. If someone wastes six months not knowing where to go, it's $96,000 of lost earnings. And I don't want that for anybody. So we're here to accelerate your career. So ask us your tech career questions, and we'll do anything we can to guide you properly to help you get your best job as fast as possible. All right. Alonzo, anything you want to say before we get kicking? I'm ready to get going. I'm ready to answer some questions. I can't underscore how important it is to, if you want to get somewhere, you got to plan it out. Just like you would go on a road trip. You got to know where you want, you're going. You got to know how to get there. You got to pack the right stuff, the right uh, road snacks and everything else. And this is pretty much the equivalent of you reaching your cloud career goal. So pack for the right stuff, learn the right stuff, understand what you need and how to get there. And we're ready to answer your questions so that you can do so. The only road snacks I need are Cheez-Its. <laughs> You need something good to wash that down with, man. Okay, Coke Zero. <laughs> Alkaline water? Are you kidding? Ah. Uh, all there right. So <laughs> let's get let's get into some of these questions here. Um, Cole oh. says, and Tyrone also Tyrone knows what to do. He said, uh, <clears throat> "Let us know what job you want." But Cole says, after completing and earning the AWS Cloud Practitioner Foundation, what would be advice to getting a job without prior experience? And we're still waiting to hear back, but I figured that would be a good one to start on. It's and a as great soon as one I see start. his career, I'll, I'll put it up there. It's a great one to start with. And Cole, the career you determine means everything. Let's say we upgraded your cloud practitioner to an AWS solution architect professional. I'm going to tell you that there's not a single job that anybody could get with that unless they also had the right set of skills. So the key is, Cole, you can learn them, and I'm sure you can. But we actually have to separate job knowledge, which is what we actually teach. Cloud architect. Versus certification knowledge. So here's what's taught in a certification, Cole. Here is the name of an AWS service, which in many cases you can't even use, in a multi-cloud environment. I'll talk about why in a second. And here's how to configure it. Now, Cole, I'm going to give you a secret. As architects, if we use the names of the AWS services in front of our clients, we'd probably be escorted out by security because they don't want to hear marketing fluff. And at the same time as cloud architects, we don't configure. So a couple of things. One, there's a completely free guide that will list every single skill that you need to learn. It's completely free. Download that skill and attend the free cloud architect webinar tomorrow. But see, let me give you an example of what we actually do. So you understand why I tell you these AWS certifications, which I love for helping you get an interview, will not give you the skills to get a job. So here's what we do as a cloud architect. We have to, our job is to improve our customer's business performance. And that's not covered in any certification whatsoever. So we basically have to ask the company, what is your vision for the company? Where do you want to take this company three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, or 12 months from now? And from that, where are we going to get this information? from the C-suite. So we're gonna be speaking to the CEO, the CIO, the CTO, all the C-level executives. And in order to do that, you're gonna need two things. You're gonna need the business acumen that you'd get from an MBA. You could learn it alternatively, teach it. Or 
And you're also going to need something called CXO relevancy because you need to be able to communicate to the CEO what they care about. The CEO is focused on things five and 10 years about. They're concerned about revenue, for example. They're concerned about the brand and all these other things. They don't care about tech. Now they care how tech can improve the business. So you're going to have to have CXO relevancy and business acumen. And these are not covered in any certification. The next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to have to really ask a lot of people on the client, what is the customer pain points? How does the customer journey work? How does the business make money? How does sales occur? How does marketing occur? How does the customer enter the system? What customer touch points exist inside the business? And how do you want to make that better? Where are the pain points, for example? How is the organization's capital structure? Meaning if they've got lots of cash and a low weighted average cost of capital, it'll be cheaper to build a hybrid cloud and a private cloud for them. If the organization has no access to capital, it might be cheaper to use an operational expense model like the public. And again, that's all critical skills. It's not taught in any certifications. We teach it, and you can learn them in, by gaining your business acumen. So there's that. So now once we understand how the business works and we're working on them to design optimal business processes, we now need to look at their current technology platforms. All the cloud is is somebody else's network in a data center. And that means we need to look at their network, what's their utilization, what's their capacity, what's their latency, what's tolerable, what's not tolerable, how do they have. We need to then figure out if we're going to migrate that to a cloud, how many clouds do we need? And 98% of customers have more than one cloud, and those multi-cloud skills are not taught in certifications. In fact, certifications teach you and bias you against multi-cloud. And, and, and so you're going to have to learn those other things. So you're going to have to learn on the technical side, the network, the data center, and the cloud. And in that document, I ask you to download this completely free. I will cover every single networking protocol and thing you need to learn as well as server, container, storage, area network. It's all going to be listed there. You're going to have a complete list. You'll know exactly what to learn. Now, it's not how to configure that. It's how it works. That's really the critical component. So now you understand that. Now, the next thing that you'll need to understand is how to design this multi-cloud architecture. The reason I say certifications bias you against, against multi-cloud is they teach you things about like the Elastic Compute Service, or Microsoft Cosmos DB, or Amazon Aurora, or Google Cloud Bigtable. Look, these are all good databases and proprietary services. They are very good. They just don't work multi-cloud. So you have to know how to use the generic equivalent, which in many cases could be better anyway, and those services are not there. Now, the next thing you need to understand as a cloud architect is we deliver presentations essentially every day. And you will, and in a cloud architect interview, you're going to have to deliver a presentation too. And it's not just an average, ordinary presentation. As cloud architects, we could be designing a billion dollar solution. We've got to deliver a billion dollar presentation to be able to close them. So wherever you're at with us, we teach it. But if not, you can go to presentation skills courses and coaches. They're out there. You're going to need those presentation skills. Now, a call is cloud architects. We have to sell our designs. We don't touch them. We don't configure them, but we sure sell them. So you're going to need to learn sales skills. There's lots of great people that teach sales. There's a Dale Carnegie Institute in New Jersey, for example, although we have a heavy sales training inside of our cloud architect development program. Now, after that, you're going to be negotiating deals, and you're going to need a lot of negotiation skills training. And again, you could take that from the Harvard Negotiation Project. You could take Chris Voss, has some negotiation training. We actually use a combination of what they would use at the Harvard Negotiation Project and Chris Voss. Now you've got these skills. Now, at this point, you need to work on your interviews. you got to go build a brand to make employers come to you. Now, the reason you need to work so hard at building your brand is when you have no experience, nobody wants to hire. But if you can build the right brand, you'll get people to come to you. I have students, the second they join Go Cloud Careers and they follow our branding works, they get 10 interview requests per day. Some get one, some get 10 based upon how strictly they follow our advice. And then poof. Now you're getting interviews with employers. And once you get on that interview, it's pretty easy to get hired with no experience. But you have to make the employers co to you. You have to go build your brand because if you don't, you're going to apply. And then HR, who has no idea who you are, will auto-reject you. That's one of the reasons, you know, we have Alonzo Coleman, who's got 30 plus years of marketing executive experience, and we made him our chief marketing officer. He built the branding component. I'm pretty good at marketing, and we were getting good results when I did it. But... Alonzo's marketing level is off the charts. So he redesigned our branding marketing to really make sure our students can build the most elite brand in the world. 
have employers come to them like vultures, go on that interview and get hired. So please don't let the completely free guy call. I got to tell you, this is the best career in the absolute world. You'll love it. You'll earn more than you have ever dreamed possible. But you know, keep that in the back of your mind and come to the free webinar. Right. So let's uh, let's see here. So I like this question um, from Craig North. Complete this sentence. In five years, the perfect cloud architect will be a bigger tech leader than they are today. See, Craig, let me tell you what's actually going on in the industry. When I started out in the industry, you know, Initially, companies were buying tech because they knew they had to, but they weren't even sure how to use it. I was in this industry for five years and organizations started to realize that tech became a competitive advantage. And that's when they really started to invest in tech. Then about five years after that, it became clear that if a company didn't have good tech, they were out of business. So then they started really investing in tech. And now there's an emergence of new technologies. Cloud's not new, it's 25 year old technology. I've been working with cloud since 1996 and the first clouds were in 1990. So cloud's not new. And networking's not new. And believe it or not, artificial intelligence isn't new. I've been working with it for over 20 years as well. What changed is now the artificial intelligence got so good, the technology got so good that it can pretty much build itself and practically manage itself. And it actually works now compared to when it did when I was younger. And as you can see this, you can see companies adopting more technology and more technology and more technology. And they're adopting technology at a more rapid rate. And that means, means we need many, many, many more architects. Now, because the architect is now looking at the business and now they're not just looking at the network and they're not just looking at the data center, they're looking at the cloud network and data center. Now they're looking at artificial intelligence. Now they're looking at more and more security. Now they're looking at more of what's the robotics, which is becoming here and now, and more automation. And now the architect basically is just the facilitator. Kind of like in football, you have a quarterback that figures out how the play goes and medicine. You've got the internal medicine or the family doctor that says, oh, you need to go to the cardiologist. You need to go somewhere. That's what the architects are doing. And, you know, I, I started to see it about 10 years ago. And I'm watching it go more and more. The architects are becoming more business executive, more business executive, more business executive. They're no longer just in the IT domain. They're in the sweet suite every day. So I think you'll see in the future architects earning even more money than they earn today, a lot more. I think you're going to notice that not only do they earn more, they're going to gain more and more respect, but you're going to see the shift. They're going to be more and more business and less and less technical. They're still going to have to understand how to get the right architect there. But you'll see one architect bringing an AI architect. Well, actually, I've been doing this for years, and most cloud architects do. But there'll be more and more of a facilitator between all the people. Higher business, better executive skills, better communication skills, better business acumen, and, of course, higher pay. So I think it's a super exciting time. Once, 25 years ago, the architects were still a little techy. Then 10 years ago, some were techy. And now they're becoming less and less techy and more and more business. And as you can see, the salaries have gone up. You know, you, it's not uncommon to find a five to $800,000 cheap architect salary. And even now, the average cloud architect salary is $218,000, although we get people jobs a lot higher paying than that sometimes too. So more and more business, less and less tech, more and more leadership, and more and more you know, strategy. Good stuff coming from all directions. Uh, all right, Mike. So uh, are you using a new microphone? I am not. I think it has to do with uh, the fact that I had my shirt zipped up too much. And it, as I was moving, the shirt was moving the microphone. It's also in a different place than it normally is. Could be because I usually have buttons, not a zipper. Yeah. Can we pull the microphone out of the inside a little bit? We could try. All right. Like like the, the microphone head, like try and see if you can get it more towards the outside. I had it on backwards. See, that's what, what I thought. I see, this is why it. they don't allow CEOs 
to actually do AV. <laughs> That's what I thought. I th I'm looking because I, I got yesterday's video and the day before's video pulled up. I'm like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, it doesn't look the same. Something's backwards. So, all right. <laughs> Sorry for all of you that had headphones on. <laughs> you got to hear Mike's microphone scraping. All right. So uh, now that we've got that fixed, make sure you, you keep bringing those questions in for us so that we can answer your questions and make sure you're going to be on the right path. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to look for the. Okay, well, I guess there's no more questions. I guess we'll be wrapping it up here. If nobody has any more questions, uh, <laughs> I'm up for a short day. Got a lot yeah, of questions. Uh, if you, if I mean, if we don't have any questions, maybe we answered them yesterday. Maybe we answered them Monday. Who knows? Okay, Robert's got a question. See, I told you as soon as I start to threaten people, that's <laughs> how it goes. Literally. <clears throat> All right, Rob. Robert says. From an OpEx perspective, what are some of the typical cost gotchas that cloud architects should look out for? Hmm. Okay, Robert, let me help you ask the question a little differently. We have to first work with the organization to determine if CapEx or OpEx is better for their organization. For some organizations, the capital expense is the best thing they can do and moving to OpEx will bankrupt them. For other organizations, operational expenses are better than a capital expense. And we need to know what's right. So first, you know, the first thing we need to do is look at an organization's weighted average cost of capital, which is a blend of all the interest rates they pay, plus what would they get by selling stock versus what do they get by financing? Why? Because in most cases, organizations actually finance their technology. Now, I can get a server from Dell for about $300,000. And over the course of four years, running that same server on Amazon is going to cost a few million. So the question becomes is, is it better for that organization to spend $300,000 versus the $2 million? And there we have to factor a lot of things. If it's just one server, you know, it's going to be simple to just buy one or two. If there's 1,000 servers it might save a lot of money being in the data center, or it might save a lot of money being in the cloud. And what's going to make that determination? That determination is the organization's capital structure, whether they have free capital, and what that organization needs to invest it into in the future. So the CapEx versus the OpEx. Obviously, running a data center, you need more people and more capable people, and that gets pretty expensive, which is OpEx or private cloud. At the same time, it's typically much cheaper than it would be to pay the cloud provider. In some cases, half a third or even less than that. So there's that. So first we need to determine if CapEx or OpEx is right for that business, their planned expenses and their investments because organizations can only invest in one time. And is it better to uh, borrow or is it better to lease or rent, which is really what the cloud is. So that's the biggest issue we have to ask first. Now, when we go to the cloud, there's a lot of expenses. We have to determine all data transfer costs. You don't pay to send it in there, but you pay to take it out. Hmm. I can give you my data for free, but getting it out, they charge me for it. So there's that. So on the cloud, we've got to pay for the networking use, which gets pretty expensive pretty fast. On the cloud, we have to pay for storage. And it's much more expensive to storage in the cloud than it is in the data center, specifically block storage, and block storage is lower performance. So we've got to calculate that. Now, we also have to calculate what if we're running any kind of serverless functions? We're going to pay every time that function goes. And that could be cheaper if it, doesn't, if it runs sporadically. And it could also run consistency consistently. And if it runs all the time, it's usually more expensive to go serverless than not serverless. We then need to really look at auto scaling and how we reserve our instances. Are we leveraging the right virtual machines and right computing platforms? Are they properly sized? What kind of capacity planning are we doing? Because, for example, 
if we've got a system and we didn't resize it when we went from the data center to the cloud, maybe it was operating at 20% utilization of the data center and we picked the same virtual machine on the cloud, same CPU cores, for example, and same amount of DRAM. And we only needed 20% and it was only 20% utilized in the data center. Maybe we can shrink it in the cloud and leverage auto scaling. Can we reserve these instances, which is going on? And we have to remember with the cloud, there's charges and charges and charges and charges. So for example, I could probably buy a 10 gigabit ethernet link to the internet. Well, actually, I know I can for about a thousand bucks a month in my house. And I could also buy a 10 gig private line for a few thousand dollars a month, depending upon the distance to 10,000 or 20,000 a month. Let's say I have a $10,000 private line connecting me to AWS or Azure or Google. Normally, I pay my 10 grand a month for that line and it's all free. Not with the cloud providers. See, with the cloud providers, I not only pay the $10,000 a month for the line, I pay a daily fee to actually connect to it and keep it up to the cloud provider, and then I actually have to pay to use it. So let these networking things get there, but it's usually about right sizing it's about proper architectures in the first place. It's about using the right services. When do you go serverless? When do you not? It's about knowing whether to use something like a serverless place to host your cloud things versus using something like a Fargate. And it's about leveraging the right services that don't lock you in should the organization want to go back. So we have to evaluate the entire thing in the entire picture. In most cases, Robert, the cloud will be substantially more expensive than the data store. Yes, I said it, substantially more expensive. And Robert, in most cases, the cloud is still worth it, even though it's more expensive. You see, in business, time is money. And the faster you can do things, and the more agile you are in business, the faster that business can grow and adapt to changes and, and market forces and economic conditions and other issues. And the cloud provides that. So those are the considerations. Does the business need to be more agile? If so, public cloud. Does the business need high availability, multi-cloud, and we can't use some of the cloud proprietary enhancements, so we can use other stuff? Where should we build ourselves a private cloud and keep it in the data center and have better performance at lower cost at lower latencies? I don't know until we know the business requirements, but there are some of the gotchas to think about. All right, all right, all right. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Okay, so a couple of questions here from Lucky. I'm going to put them up back to back. I answered one in the chat box already, but I figured it's a great discussion to have. So let me put all put each of them up. So Lucky says, "When is the session going to start for Cloud Architect?" Um, to be honest, I don't have any experience in networking, though. And then the last one. What is the difference between Cloud Architect Career Program and Elite Cloud Architect Bundle? Okay, so lucky. So the first question is, when is the Cloud Architect going to start? Well, I don't know whether you're talking about our webinar tomorrow, which is completely free, or whether you're talking about the program. The webinar is tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and my team will pop it there. The program starts the moment you sign up. And I'm gonna tell you how and why we do this. Because we are deeply concerned about getting our people hired, not just getting them signed up. So the second a student signs up in our program, they start the online modules. Because our programs, all of them, or at least our programs or anything that doesn't say non-live, has live classes several times per week. It has video on demand for you to do, for you to learn. It has homework assignments for you to do, interview practice for you to do, negotiation practice for you to do, resume practice for you to do, and of course the training for your career. And that's all that. And that is self-paced. And then we have three live classes each week in our Cloud Architect Pro, well, three for the basic and more for the elite, which we'll get to soon. And in that, ba and in that classes, you know, I'll teach architectures. Like two of the days we'll do architecture work and one of those days we're going to do those critical business skill things. And we repeat those classes, the live ones, every four months or so. And that way, if you join today, you join next week or you join a month from now, you're all going to get the same classes as anyone would do. 
We do this for two reasons. First, I can take you at any day and get you started. The average cloud architect earns $817 a day. So I don't want to wait two months to start a batch because that'll they'll lose $32,000 in terms of earnings. And that makes no sense. The second reason, Lucky, is when you train with us, you stay in our program until you're hired. We are not a boot camp. We retrain everybody else's boot camp graduates. It makes me upset. When you join our program, you stay in it until you're hired. You stay in those live classes three times a week for a year. And the rest of the content, the Slack community, the training, it's available until you are hired. And all the people are there to support you. So there's that. Of course, you'll have projects. Of course, you'll do some work on AWS. Of course, you'll do some work on Azure. But you know anybody can do that. You're going to do real projects with us. You're going to come into our data center after you do those basic cloud things. You're going to design and build your own cloud from scratch. And that way, somebody else, when they said, I learned to configure something, you can say, I designed and built my own cloud. You'll work with real data centers and server virtualization and all their things. And by the time you know, you see what the cloud is, it's all going to make sense to you. So that's our basic cloud architect career development program. Our graduates are working in AWS, Azure, Cisco, Apple, IBM, Accenture, KPMG, Deloitte, Capgemini, you name it, they're there. With or without experience, it doesn't matter. We've got all the testimonials to prove it. Now that's our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Our Elite Cloud Architect Program is probably the best program in the entire world. It's my entire life's work. And it is the Cloud Architect Career Development Program I just told you about, plus our Tech Leadership Program, plus our interview program. So what is this tech leadership program? Well, the difference between a $200,000 architect and a half a million dollar architect or a half a million dollar plus uh, uh, technology executive is business acumen. In fact, you can look it up on salary.com. The average salary of someone with biz strong business acumen skills is $558,000 a year. So the elite program includes the Cloud Architect program plus the business acumen program. And it's a partnership between us and the University of Tennessee at Martin. We have two business school professors that teach things they teach in the MBA program there. Plus, we also teach all the stuff that's not in the MBA program. And I needed about $100,000 of training in these things after my MBA to be an elite architect. Things like executive presence, we discuss heavily in there. We really get heavy into presentation skills, heavy into communication skills, heavy into leadership skills. And we're doing this because we want you to get these bigger jobs, you know, like a principal architect role. You know, here's one at AWS. Average pay is 372, but the pay range is 291 to 491. Better business skills, better sales skills. You're getting 491, not 291. Typical student graduate might end up being a senior director at like a Cisco or a Palo Alto a few years later. And that job pays on average 540, but the pay range you can see is 425 to 709. Again, it's all business acumen that makes the determination. Here's another job we expect people to get after that, like a senior director at Cisco, average pay 527. And I'll show you with their architect jobs once we get into these elite roles. And we're really preparing you for these in the elite program. Here's a principal architect role in Microsoft. We don't expect you to get this upon graduation, but a few years in with these elite business skills, we'd hope you to get one. Average pay is 379, but pay range is 300 to 495. Here's another one at Google, principal architect. And these are for the best communicators, best leaders, best business people. Average pay for a principal architect at Google is 508, but the range is 394 to 677. And that's all based upon your interview skills and your business acumen and your sales skills in these roles. So first, the elite program includes that cloud architect program that's gotten everybody hired everywhere. Then it includes that business acumen program. And then it includes our tech interview mastery program. Now, that is something really special. Students that have taken this have already landed even better jobs. It's really about mastering the interview. And we cover the behavioral science of mastering the interview, how to prepare for the interview, how to do every little component of the interview, and why. When you looked at all those jobs I showed you, there was $150,000 to $300,000 difference between the top and bottom paid person for the position. And how good you interview determines how big of a role you get. Because the more you interview, the more you desirable you are. That's why some actors get paid $20 million a movie, and some get paid $2,000 to be in there for a short stint. It's how desirable they are. So that interview is about program is about making you super desirable to the employer. So now you know. Cloud Architect Career Development Program, out there, get you an incredible Cloud Architect job. 
at the lowest price we can afford to do it. And the elite program is to not only get you that first job, but to prepare you for years and years and years of success. All right. So let's see here. Let me make sure I get back in order here. Um, okay, here we go. From Carla Campos, what is the relationship between business intelligence and cloud architecture? Or where do you see the link of combining these two careers? I, I don't see any correlation. There's a difference between business acumen and business intelligence. Business intelligence is typically looking at data. Business intelligence is a back-end, relatively low-paid position. It's much more like accounting. By comparison to accounting, which is looking back-end, Finance is very strategic. How do we take the organization's finances and use it to grow the business? Architecture is a lot more like the finance than the accounting side. And that's why finance people earn far more than the accounting people. Because the people that know how to make the money get paid more than the people that track the money. A cloud architect is a finance person. I would like you to invest in this because this is your expected rate of return. Now, some of the knowledge you got from business intelligence would be great, but combining them would actually hurt you because you're combining the sales skills of one which pays more, the leadership skills more of one which pays more, the, the, the design of one which pays more, and the business intelligence would hold you back. And what we're dealing with is taking a top brand and a bottom brand. And what I mean by that is we have Lexus, for example, which, make, which is made by Toyota, and it's got a better paint job, it's got a better brand, it's got better seats in it, and it costs a lot more than the identical Toyota. Why? Because one carries a Toyota stamp, and one carries a Lexus stamp, and if they put Toyota or a part that says Toyota on a Lexus, it's worthless. General Motors made this mistake. They had a Cadillac, and they had a Chevy Cavalier. The Cavillac was a Cimarron. Same car in every way, shape, or form. What happened is General Motors ran out of some Cadillac parts. They put the ones that said Chevy on it. There was a lawsuit against them. People went up in arms. The value of that car dropped like a stone because it had something that said Chevy, even though it was an identical part, but it was stamped differently. So that's why we don't want to combine these. That's why we don't want to get a SysOp certification and be an architect. It does the same problem. So architecture is about how do I design the business to be better? What does that mean? What new services does the technology enable the business to offer? Now, what can artificial intelligence do for a fuel comp for an airplane company? Can it help them determine how to buy fuel option contracts at a cheaper price by making a better predictive? Is there something we can do with internet of technology that can enable people floating through an airport to do something differently? Of course there is. Architecture is about, well, you know, we've got this agility of the cloud. How can a business lever this agility to do something differently to earn more? That's cloud architecture. Where people confuse it as cloud engineering, the people that sit behind the screen and configure stuff by clicking and monitoring the CLI. We architects don't do that. So there's really no relationship between business intelligence and cloud architecture. There's a relationship between business strategy. So Carlos, I'll tell you, at one point I had a job as a management and strategy consultant. You know what I was doing? business architecture work. Then I had a job as an enterprise architect. You know what I was doing? The same job I did as a strategy consultant. And I've done cloud architect and enterprise architect jobs and network architect jobs. You know what I do? The same thing. The only thing that changes is my tool. If I'm a network architect, I'm recommending networking strategies. If I'm a cloud architect, I'm recommending cloud strategies. If I'm an enterprise architect, I'm recommending the same thing. So you can think of cloud architecture as a consulting job. Learn about the business and find a way to make it better. As a cloud architect, your tool is cloud technologies, which is networking data center, cloud artificial intelligence, big data, you know, all that stuff. Great question, Carla. I'm so glad you asked. All right. So, Antaeus, Antaeus, Logan, Hello, family. When does the class start for the Elite Cloud Architect program? Because I just enrolled. Thanks again. 
Yeah. Well, nice to have you. I have to jo- have you join us. We look forward to working with you. And, and uh, uh, I'll, Mike, if you want, you want to take this one. Or you want me to talk? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take the first half of this, and I'm going to have you take the rest. All and right. Teos, I'm so happy you're with us. I know I exchanged an email with you yesterday. And I don't normally get involved in emails. I know you're a firefighter. I know I was a firefighter. Thank you so much for your service. And let's see what an incredible career we can build for you. Chris, why don't you take it from here? Yeah. So, so as Mike mentioned previously, as uh, one of the components of this is actually the, the Cloud Architect Career Development Program. So you start that right now. I've also sent you an email while, while Mike is over here answering questions. I sent you a, an email. Hopefully you get that. But uh, you can start in the training portal in the orientation course right now. And then you can get at what you complete the orientation course. Then you can get access to all the training and all the modules and, and everything. Now, uh, Cloud Architect Career Development Program classes start tomorrow for you because that's our next live class for that program. Um, then the um, and that will be with Mike. And then Friday's class will be with Dr. Johnson and Dr. Long from the University of Tennessee at Martin. And uh, yeah, and then you'll continue with the Tuesday, Thursday, Friday classes for for that program. Our first uh, elite cloud architect class specific to that program will be Saturday, September 30th. The pattern for those classes are the last weekend of the month, unless that that weekend happens to coincide with a, a holiday period here in the United States. So for example, if, if usually, usually happens around like Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, those, those, those tend to usually kind of interrupt that session, but, and then they just, we delay it for a week, but your first one will be Saturday, September 30th. And we'll have two classes that day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And, um, and yeah, we are looking forward to that. So if you've got any more questions, uh, make sure to go through that orientation course and then you'll join our Slack community and then you can ask all the questions that you want. Uh, we definitely look forward to working with you and anyone else that, that has joined. I know that we had someone else enroll right when we, a little bit after we started the session today, but I don't know if they're here on YouTube for us to acknowledge, but <laughs> uh, thank you. Looking forward to it. Um I know Alonzo's excited about that as well. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a I had the extreme pleasure of of speaking with Antaeus multiple times. And this wasn't our first time. We had spoke earlier this year. He had some things that he was working on and he wanted to get back later on this year. He felt, you know, follow through with what he said. Now he's here and we're excited. We have Craig North. We have a lot of people here that are that are in those in those classes and they're gonna welcome you with open arms. And I think you're going to have a real exciting ramp up period um, and you're going to learn so much uh, from this program and you're going to really, really intensify your cloud uh, architect trajectory. So I'm excited for you, Antaeus. All right. All right. Let's see what our next one is. And while Chris is digging up the next questions, please ask your questions now so we can assist you. Yep. And I really do so because, you know, people try to get a private call with me. And honestly, there's an 18 and a half week wake now, almost 19 weeks for a 1200 hour an hour session. And I'm here now and I'm free. And that's why I do this free every week. because I want to help you. So please take advantage of it while we're here. All right. So Tariq says, I may have missed it, but what would be top few skills a cloud architect would need to learn to land their first cloud architect job, entry job salary in U.S. or Canada? Okay, Tariq. Now, I want to make it clear there's no top few skills. You have to be prepared. Kind of like to be to be a doctor and work as a doctor, you have to be prepared. And to fly an airplane, you better be prepared. Otherwise, you know, it's not very forgiving when you land. And uh, having said that, this is really what you need to understand. First, system design skills. Because what are you doing? You're designing. So how are you designing the systems for your client? That's your job. And what are you designing? Well, you're dealing with servers and containers and storage and databases and business applications and security devices. And what are, is all that stuff? Networking and data center technology. So you must know the network, the data center, and the cloud. 
And since 98% of organizations are multi-cloud, and that often includes hybrid cloud, that's where all these clouds. So a cloud is somebody else's network in a data center that's been virtualized. So got to learn that, all the technologies. And there's a free document, my team will pop in the chat box for you, that lists every one of those technologies that you need to know how to design. Now, designing and configuring are two different things. If you want to configure, great, I love that, get some hands-on experience, but it won't teach you how to design. It'll teach you nothing about design. So make sure you learn design because that's our job. Next, here's what we have to do. We have to go to our clients and ask them about their business, their business goals, their business pain points, and their business strategies, which means if you don't know business, you can't be an architect. So you must develop a substantial amount of business acumen. Without it, when someone says, we need to do something with our tech to improve our revenue, and you don't know what revenue is, how are you going to do it? When someone says our, our human capital costs are too expensive, what can you do to reduce our human capital costs while increasing our output? You better know about operations of businesses, for example, and where we can make redundancies and what technology can automate what or how we do strategic outsourcing of things, because we do that as architects all the time. Now, the next is called, uh, is called executive presence. Tariq, I'll give you an example. Hi, Tariq. My name is Mike Gibbs. I'm a cloud architect. Now, here's the thing. If I do that, no one will listen to me. No one will pay attention. And when I've got a billion-dollar architecture with con and I'm working on constant billion-dollar architectures, the client wouldn't even listen to me. Now, if I said, hi, I'm Mike Gibbs, it changes everything because I learned how to use the space, I learned how to use my voice. I learned how to use gestures. How executive presence is next. Sales skills. As architects, we sell. Most of us work pre-sales. And what does that mean? We find the client's needs. We design a solution. And we go sell it back to them. And we get paid based upon how much we sell. We could have a 50% bonus or 100% bonus based on our salary and it's based on how much we sell. If we can't sell, we don't get the job. If we can't sell, we get fired. If we can sell, we can earn an extra two, three hundred thousand dollars that year. So sales skills critical. The next of the most critical skills are, realistically speaking, presentation skills. Why? As architects, you present every day, and you present to your clients. You present to your company to get more resources. You present solutions, you present at conferences, you're presenting everywhere, every single day. So they're the most critical skills that you need to learn. They're not all of them, but they're not. Now, what did you notice? I talked about network data center and cloud design skills. But I also talked all the rest of it was business skills. Of the people that have taken other people's trainings, first, first they never learned design, they learned configuration, which was different. And none of them were trained in the business leadership, sales, executive presence, communication. And that's why we have to retrain them to get them hired. So those are the critical skills. Do just the tech, and you can get an engineering job. Now, entry-level salary, you know, Tariq, I, I typically, what do we hear about 150 to 180 entry level for our average student, Chris? Is it somewhere in there? That's the average yeah. entry-level salary that we're seeing. Yeah. We've had absolutely. some people get jobs, you know, over 200. Entry level, we got a lot of people senior solution architect jobs, and sometimes we get people enterprise architect jobs, which pay more. And I've seen some that are lower, too. Now, if someone's presentation skills, sales skills are lower, they're going to end up much lower if they get hired. But, you know, I'd say 150 to 180 is a pretty standard average for us. And another thing to point out is that, you know, a lot of these roles are, are commission-based or sales-based or bonus-based or, or, you know, based on, based on your criteria. And what's going to help you increase your bonus potential if you're in a sales-related role? Your ability to sell, your ability to communicate, your emotional intelligence, your soft skills, all of these things that you're not able to get anywhere else. So yeah. while we're talking about these, these positions, or there's also the, un, the unquantifiable, I mean, it is quantifiable, but it's harder to get. Yeah. Uh, the the, quant the quantification, these uh, bonus, the, this bonus potential, and that's where all of our training and skills come in. So I just wanted to point that out. I'm going to put the next question up, and then I got to go grab my my charger. Apparently, I don't know what I did to my charger, so my computer's going to die. 
So, been there, I've been there more than once, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I just got a notification. I'm glad that the computers notify you. Unlike when I was a kid and they didn't notify you, it just died. Just uh, uh, all right. Here we go from Robert. I think. is it? Did it pop up? Yes. Okay. Any thoughts on the current state of OpenStack or CloudStack and the architect tool belt? Also, VMware use today. Okay, Robert, if you don't know VMware, you can't be a cloud architect because 90% of your customers are going to be using VMware in some capacity. Now, I don't think it's an OpenStack versus CloudStack. I think it's an OpenStack versus Nutanix question you're asking me. CloudStack, I don't think you need to think about it at all. Everybody needs to understand OpenStack. In fact, every one of our students builds an OpenStack cloud as part of our program. Yes, architects don't configure anything in their job, but I make everybody get familiar with OpenStack. Here's the reason OpenStack is the winner. It's owned by IBM. I mean, technically Red Hat, which is owned by IBM. There is no company in the entire world other than Microsoft, Cisco, and IBM that have that level of experience in digital transformation and improving their customer's business performance. OpenStack is everywhere. Now, Nutanix is another beautiful option. Nutanix is extremely good technology. A little easier to use with OpenStack, a little more friendly, has a beautiful little integration with Cisco right now. And there's a reason I almost took a, a director level position there a few years ago at Nutanix. I truly believe in the company. Now their, their technology is great. So the question becomes, is it OpenStack or Nutanix? Ugh, that's a hard one to tell. I think OpenStack is gonna be the one that actually gets there because of their, their business acumen from IBM. But I love Nutanix and I hope they and they hope they become a major player. So those, but OpenStack versus Nutanix are really, really, really what you need to know. All right. So the next question from Lucky is a good question. So Lucky says, I'm a student at the moment, but I also want to learn about Cloud Architect. Can I start by Cloud Architect career program first and later do the Elite Cloud Architect? Sure can. Absolutely. Lucky. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, because and also um, an added part of that is as since the Cloud Architect Career Development Program is part of that elite Cloud Architect, we're not going to make you pay for it twice. No. Mm -hmm. You'll receive a if you enroll in the Cloud Architect Career Development Program and then decide that you want to enroll in the elite Cloud Architect Program, that you'll receive a credit for that enrollment that you've already you've already made. You know, that is, so just, so yes, definitely, absolutely, you can do that. We've had many, we've had many people do that, actually. Um, so if that's how, if that's, because yeah. if that's what, how you'd like to do it, by all means, please do. And like I said, we'll, we can upgrade you, I guess would be the term, um, or at a later date. Mm -hmm. Where we done it before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Craig, what are the salary ranges and opportunities overseas? I plan on retiring in the Philippines, but I wouldn't mind moving there earlier if I can work there. <laughs> Craig, I happen to love the Philippines. I'm an Eskrima practitioner. Did all my Eskrima training, obviously, from Filipino people because it comes from the Philippines. Love Cali as well. Great place. Now, having said that, Salaries overseas vary and they vary dramatically. We've gotten many people 300,000 Australian dollar jobs in Australia. That's no big deal and it's relatively easy to do. We've gotten people, you know, six figure plus pound sterling in the UK, and we've gotten people extremely good high paying jobs throughout Europe. We've also gotten people jobs in India, Pakistan, and elsewhere. They tend to pay less. We've also helped people get jobs in Africa, and they also tend to pay less, but then again, their standard, their cost of living is so much lower that in the end, it almost works out to be the same thing. Now, Craig, you're American, so let me give you a little secret about how to do this the right way. You could try going to the Philippines now and getting a job, and you will. Or you could do what I did, which is what the people that I know do, is they get themselves a job while they're living in the U.S., and then they tell their employer that they'd like to move to their house in the Philippines. I have a place in Greece, and I want to go work in my house in Greece. 
Now, the second they do that, they say, can you travel? And I say, of course I can travel. I've been traveling forever and they don't change my pay. And then I can keep my U.S. pay, sit in my house in Naparamos, Greece, sit on the beach and drink ouzo with my buddies in the evening and eat octopus, have big, big time fun. So, you know, that's the way I would do it. You could do it the other way, Craig, and don't get me wrong. We get people getting hired in every single part of the world. But if you can take your U.S. pay and you can move it to a place with a the cost of living that's maybe 10% of what it is here, here, now you're the wealthiest of the wealthy of the wealthy. And we use in, in the currency markets and financial training something called arbitrage, meaning you buy something in one place cheap and you sell it in another place expensive. Well, that's exactly what you're doing. They're going to buy you expensive and you're going to live someplace cheap and you're going to have a great time in the Philippines. There are going to be an incredible number of wonderful people there. You're going to be treated like gold. But while you're at it, do yourself a favor. Learn some Cali or Eskrima. What a great martial art. Great exercise and a ton of fun. Right. So, he says exactly what I was planning. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Just bought my lot last week. Nice. All right. So, uh, next one is our last question. So if anybody's got any questions, make sure to put them in the chat box, put them in the comments. If you're on LinkedIn, you know, we're here for you. If we, uh, if, if we answer all your questions, then by all means, we got, we got some other things we can get to work on. We got a conference coming up. We got new training programs that we're working on new content for our existing programs that we're developing and all kinds of things. So if you've got any questions, put them in there. If not, I'm going to put Mike and Alonzo to work on other things. And <laughs> so they're probably over here like, please ask questions. Ask questions. <laughs> we don't want Chris putting us to work. So um, Cole says, hello, guys. Uh, what would an alternate role be without prior experience and a certified AWS Cloud Foundation? Cole. I'm going to say this again. If you had all 10 AWS certifications mm -hmm. and nothing else, you wouldn't be prepared for any job. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in an AWS certification that will get you any job. But I'll give you some options that you could use. If you happen to have an MBA and really good sales experience, you could, be, you could do cloud sales, where realistically, the MBA and your sales skills get you the job. And the cloud practitioner says, huh, Cole has some familiarity with AWS. He's probably going to be good for cloud sales. Now, if you wanted to be a cloud admin, we might upgrade that cloud practitioner to a certified solution architect professional, and then you would learn Linux to be a cloud admin. You'd learn Terraform to be a cloud admin. You'd learn Python to be a cloud admin. You'd learn Bash shell scripting to be a cloud admin, and you'd learn Windows PowerShell scripting to be a cloud admin, and then you could be a cloud admin. Now, the reason I said certified solution architect professional is that's still relatively basic. And at least at that level, you almost have the skills to do the configuration. And all the rest of that stuff that I told you is what's going to get you hired. Now, to, a cloud, to become a cloud engineer, it would be the same step. But now as a cloud engineer, you're going to need better Terraform skills, better Linux skills, better scripting skills, better knowledge better knowledge of SQL queries, because a cloud engineer might be doing that. A cloud engineer might be working a little bit on some integrations between certain things, and it's a much heavier, more technical role. There is no AWS certification that has anything related in it to a, get a job. But that doesn't mean you need a certification. We trained Delroy Bat, and he got a cloud security architect job with zero certification. We took Jeffrey West, and Jeffrey West was doing some kind of cool geology, geospatial imaging thing. Wasn't a tech job. And we trained him to be an architect, and he got a cloud architect job with no experience, with just a cloud practitioner. Robert Welch got a senior level cloud security architect job, and it was a big job. And he only had a cloud practitioner, but he was trained in things. So Cole, what skills do you have that are outside the cloud practitioner? That's the real thing that I need you to remember. The certification just says, I know the name of the vendor stuff. That's it. It's nothing. It's, it, it's, it's not that you didn't work hard for it. And it wasn't that it was on a hard journey because the cloud provider made it a challenge. But there's more cloud AWS certified people that are out there. 
and they, they and even the people that work for AWS as cloud engineers and cloud admins have to do a million and one things other than just the stuff that's covered in the certification. So if you tell me which role you would like to get to, I can give you a plan to get there. But I'm going to tell you 90% of it won't be the stuff in the certification. They're going to be skills that are outside the certification. And that's why we get people certified. In fact, I interviewed 1,000 AWS people and tried to see if they could do any job. And in just the AWS certification, the answer was no. But you still can get hired. So tell me what role you want. And then we can tell you what skills you need to have. It's not like I have a certification. What job can I get? Because then, sadly, the answer is none. The answer is, I want to get a job. What do I need? It's really no different than if you wanted to cook dinner for your friends. First, you'd have to figure out what number of friends you're going to invite over. Then you're going to figure out what your friends like. And I know you previously said you wanted to be a cloud architect, so I gave you the skills. And now you're asking what else. So. Tell me what other jobs you might like, and I'd love to help you get there. Want to be a DevOps engineer? We'll tell you how to get there. Want to be a cloud engineer? We'll tell you how to get there. Want to be a cloud admin? You want to be there. You want to be a cloud network engineer? We'll still tell you how to get there. I just need to know what you want to do. The certification doesn't drive your job. The certification is kind of like wrapping paper. Like if you bought a friend, a spouse, a gift. The gift is what they're going to be interested in. You and your skills are the gift. Now, inside of the gift, the gift looks nicer if you put wrapping paper on it and a pretty bow. That's what the certification is. It's wrapping paper and a pretty bow that makes you look more attractive to employers. But it's all the stuff that's not covered in the certification, which is the actual skills necessary for the job. So tell me the job, and I'll give you some time to tell me, because I want to help you. But, I, but I'm going to tell you right now the certification isn't really anything. And that's why we give away certification training free. I don't ever want to see anybody do it. Now, we don't train the cloud practitioner because we don't, we, we'd rather people start with the certified solution architect associate. It's just the same amount of effort and it, it's, it's better recognized. But if you're in a place where you got given free access to a cloud practitioner class, great, take it. I'm thrilled. Now, what do you want to do? Now, let's get the go. You do that. You're going to be perfectly in great shape. That's the secret. Find the skills for the career and then do it. So tell me which career you want, and then I'll help you build the course. It's kind of like having a car with no, no gas or diesel. It doesn't go anywhere, but you got the car. So now let's figure out what kind of fuel we need to give you to, to supercharge you to take off like a rocket ship. All right. So we'll wait. We'll wait a few minutes to see if Cole has anything else to add into that, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll answer Yinka's question while we're waiting. Yinka says, "Kindly summarize a pathway for a complete newbie to become a DevOps engineer." Okay, Yinka, great question, and it's not a career that we specialize in, but I can tell you the things that you really need to do. DevOps engineers are ideal for software developers who now want to do something different. A developer basically writes code all day, and a DevOps engineer is a hybrid between someone that the, that's responsible for the operations of software deployment as well as development. So first, you got to become a pretty good developer. And that means close to mastery of at least one programming language. Could be Python for right now. And that's generally an easy place to start, and it's a language that's typically used everywhere. Now, next, you really have to learn the DevOps tools. Things like Git, Jenkins, Spinnaker, and all those other tools that are out there. Some will be on the cloud, and some will be not off the cloud. But, you know, there's a lot of DevOps that actually occurs in our data centers. There's a lot of DevOps that occurs. So you're going to have to learn those DevOps tools. <clears throat> Now, cloud engineers do a lot of work with, I'm sorry, DevOps engineers do a lot of work with Kubernetes. You're going to have to have some mastery of Kubernetes. Going to be something that it's really, really strong. And uh, <clears throat> kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, after Kubernetes, you're going to be doing a lot of work as infrastructure as code. Now, that's not going to be AWS CloudFormation or Azure Bicep. It's going to be Terraform in most cases. And that's really the valuable skill. Why Terraform? Why not AWS CloudFormation? Why not uh, Azure Bicep? Good stuff, but 
98% of organizations are multi-cloud, so most organizations use multi-cloud tools. Now, Linux, let's face it, all this stuff is on Linux. And everybody does everything on Linux. So you're going to have to master that. Now, as a DevOps engineer, you're still going to be doing work on the cloud. So you're going to have to have some moderate cloud familiarity. I would pick a cloud provider, and I would get pretty hands-on. I'd say AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional or Azure Solutions Architect Expert. They're engineering, not architecture certifications, and that'll give you there. And I'd probably do one of the cloud provider's de DevOps certifications, but not the associate, the professional. You do that, you're going to have the solid skills. Now, when you reach this kind of situation where you've got all the skills, how do you go from the newbie to getting hired? Some of it's going to be building a brand to make people come to you, Yinka. And the other side of it is when you're new and you don't have any experience, you got to really train the interview. Hi. I've got two people side by side. When I interview somebody, 50% is about your ability to do the job. And the other 50% is about other stuff. Yinka, the other stuff is the secret. Why? Because let's say you can train and become a 40 out of 50 or 80% good enough at the job. I can work with that. Here's what I also care. Here's what the other 50% of your interview square is. Are you energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate about the work? Are you likable? Can somebody trust you? Are you willing to go above and beyond? Are you a team player? And are you emotionally intelligent? And that's the secret to getting bigger jobs that are bigger than you've ever dreamed for. And we, we have such a heavy focus, at least in our training, and we don't train DevOps engineers on how to make the state the op exact optimal hire that the employer wants. That's why our students get hired and hired and hired, because that's the stuff that stands out. So try to do those things, Yanka. I would also recommend finding a good DevOps mentor, someone that's been in the field and been successful in the field, and consistently check in with them. And by doing so, they can trust you, assess your strengths. They can assess your weaknesses, tell you areas you need for improvements. And Yinka, I think you're going to do wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderful. It is a lot. It is a lot. Now, I'm going to be very clear. There is no job which pays anything which doesn't require you to learn a lot. The only job where you don't have to learn that much is to work at a fast food restaurant and, and make hamburgers and french fries and Cokes. And I don't mean that in a negative way. There's a reason these tech jobs pay a lot. And Yinka, I have a feeling you're going to have a really, really, really great career. But you're going to have to learn them. And be thankful that it's hard. And you know why? If it was easy, everybody would do it and it wouldn't pay anything. Because it's hard, most people won't go through the effort and they most won't learn it. And that way, the jobs that are left over, there's only a small number of people that can do them. And when there's only a small number of people that can do the job, the price is high. It's that supply and demand curve that we deal with in macro and microeconomics. So that's what you need to do. Chris, I think there's a second half of this. All right. All right. Sounds like a lot. How far do I need to go with the Linux as, in, as regards to certification? Is LPI essentials enough? You think it's not about certifications. I don't care when I hire people if they have any certifications or not. I care can they do the job. Generally speaking, when someone has too many certifications, I know they can't do anything. And here's the reason why. Certifications are so basic and intro level and people focus so hard at, at training the certification questions that they don't actually train how to do the job. I need you to learn Linux. How would you update the kernel? How would you install a graphics card and graphics drivers in Linux? How would you add a user? Where are the log files for the systems that go on? How would you set up the IP tables firewall on it? How would you remove packages on Linux to harden the Linux environment? How do you encrypt the drives? How do you mount drives in Linux? How do you write a bash script to automate something, for example? 
How do you patch Linux? Those are the skills that you need. The file systems, the file structures, that's what you need. If you've got a certification, great. If you don't have a certification, who cares? Hiring managers don't care. I've asked thousands of them. None of them care. They care do you have the skills. And Yanka, I'll tell you why hiring managers no longer care about certifications. AWS allows exam free re exam retakes, which means you can bomb it and take it again for free, so that doubled the number of people. Azure allows open book exams. I could point you to any number of 20 websites where you could buy a copy of the exam before you got there. And every single day before I block them, some character reaches out to me on LinkedIn and says, I can pass the exam for you. Just give me a few hundred bucks. That's the reason certifications don't mean a lot. And also what happened is certifications went from training you about technology to more, let me tell you about my new cool, exciting thing that's 20 years old that I gave it a brand new name. Here's why you should use it, not how it works or those things. So it's not that I don't like certifications at all. And it's that you need the stuff outside of the certification. So be, uh, you do that, you're going to be in great shape. All right. So Cole gave us a response. You're asking about those other positions that he wanted uh, uh, to consider. He said, thanks, Mike. That's exactly what I did. I took the free course. And then he said uh, his other considering roles were cloud or network engineer. Okay, so call network engineer, cloud engineer, two different skills. So network engineer. Generally speaking, and I'm going to give you the full list, I've got a lot of network engineers hired by a lot of great companies. To be a network engineer, you need to understand TCP IP, how it sets up a connection, uh, how to subnet it, how to supernet it, um, how to look at the packets with a packet filter. You need to understand EIGRP, the routing protocol, OSPF, the routing protocol, uh, ISIS is the routing protocol, BGP, EBGP, IBGP, to, to say the least. You need to understand NAT, one-to-one -one NAT, one-to-many NAT, static NAT, dynamic NAT, PAT. You need to understand LAN switching technology, whether that be VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, the types of trunking that are available, link aggregation groups, understanding first hop redundancy protocols such as VRRP or HSRP and those sorts of environments. It'll be static NAT, dynamic NAT, PAT. It'll be access control lists and other packet filters for networking engineers. Network engineers in today's world typically understand a little Python because they do a little infrastructure as code as routers. You'll need to understand the authentication mechanisms, whether it be TACX Plus, Radius, Active Directory that the routers and switches use. And if you master those protocols, you'll have a great job as a network engineer. Now, if you top it off with a CCNP, Cisco Certified Network Professional, once you've done all of this and you've learned all this, that'll be the fancy wrapping paper to take your skills and show the world that you're there. Now, cloud engineer, you're going to need to understand the network and the data center, whether that be servers or server virtualization or containers or container orchestration or storage area networks, what virtual machines, for example, a lot of networking things like VLAN, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking. IP things, the same kind of IP things I talked about for the network engineer without the routing protocols. Cloud engineers are going to need to have good, strong knowledge of infrastructure as code. That means Terraform. Cloud engineers are going to need good, strong knowledge of Python and writing Python scripts. Cloud engineers are going to be writing Bash shell scripts. They're going to be writing Windows PowerShell scripts. Cloud engineers are going to have to have rock solid knowledge of Linux. Installing packages, updating kernels, removing unnecessary services, closing down ports, dealing with the firewalls, installing any malware kind of stuff. And then it's going to be good experience with the command line because cloud engineers are hands-on all day, all day, all day. That's how you get a cloud engineering job. Cloud architects are about design. 
Clan engineers are about hands-on configuration. All right, Yinka says, sorry if I misled you there. I meant to ask if the knowledge gain preparing for the LPI essentials would do. I've listened to you long enough not to focus on certifications. Yeah, I think that's a good distinction. So uh, the knowledge mm -hmm. learned from, or assumed to have been learned from that certification. I don't think we can take the knowledge that's assumed to be learned in that certification and count it as what you need. I think you need to really get hands on. And if I were to ask you right now where are the log files, you need to know it. Because as an engineer, you're going to be there. If I asked you which ports are open and how do you close it, I need you to know that. If I ask you how do you update the kernel, I need you to just know it and it needs to be second nature to you. Now, if you pass the certification or not, I don't know. Now, if I tell you that I want to install the Apache web server and I want to install this and I want to install that, can you do it? If the answer is yes, you're good to go. Now I want to push a GPU into this machine in, into my into my system because we want to do some machine learning on it. Can you install the GPU, the drivers, the CUDA drivers, and all that other stuff? Install the TensorFlow, the PyTorch, and all that stuff, and get it up and running for the data scientist that wants to use it. Can you do it? The answer is yes. You've got the right Linux skills. So more about how would you operate Linux as a systems administrator, that's the skill that you would need to have as a cloud engineer because they are the new systems administrators for the most part. Great questions, Yanko. <clears throat> so, you know, Yanko, there's two ways to do this. When I had people that wanted engineering jobs, I used to give them Linux therapy. And you might ask what Linux therapy is. I, I used to tell them to take their computer. It usually has Windows. That's how they would operate their life. Back up all their data, erase it, and put one of the harder to use Linuxes on their system like Red Hat. Install all the drivers, get everything working, for example. And use it every day. Install stuff from the command line. Do some networking tracing from the command line, pilling, telnet, SSH, trace route. Just use it. Use it every day for a little while. Install this package, install that package, create some KVM virtual machines on your, your system. And guess what, Yenka? You'll have all the Linux knowledge you need. And play with it. You're going to do great. All right. So. Craig North says, CCNA, Linux, MBA, rank them, must have, like to have, don't need. I'm going to go ahead and amend this and add the what, what, what Yinka basically just said. So let's, let's, take, let's not look at this from just pure certification. Let's look at this because we know how we feel about certification alone. Yeah. Let's talk about the knowledge that's assumed to have been gained from a CCNA, Linux or MBA, how would you rank those, Mike? Well, cloud architect, we don't touch Linux. You do need to understand what is the kernel and how's the kernel deal with memory and CPU scheduling because that's systems architecture. Well, let's take, let's pause here for a second. That's a big distinction. Yeah. We're making a big assumption. Now we all know Craig, <laughs> so we know what Craig's desired goal is, but for everyone else, what's the role you desire? That's yeah, gonna that's have the a first thing. Yeah. We, so we know Craig. We know Craig's desire is cloud architect. So that's why we immediately went to that answer. But the first thing you have to figure out is what's the role? That's going to determine how this question is answered. So now, now that I've now yeah. that we've cleared that air <laughs> as to why we immediately went to cloud architect. So as a since I knew you were a cloud architect, I'd say Linux knowledge of the kernel necessary. CCNA. Guess what? The CCNA is too basic for the average cloud architect. The CCNA does not contain BGP, and it has nothing to do with system design. Now, the reason I recommend the CCNP for cloud architects, and I don't, it's not to learn how to be an architect because they won't learn it in this, but a cloud architect is a network architect and a data center architect combined in one. So having a CCNP level certification will help you get an interview, assuming you have the requisite networking knowledge. Now the MBA, 
If I was going to do anything, it would be the MBA, and here's the reason why. And the three of us on this call all have MBAs, which cost over $100,000 to $150,000 each. The MBA is the best stamp you can put on your resume that shows business acumen. Now, can you graduate an MBA program and not know anything about business? 100%. And if I tell you that 80% of MBA graduates know nothing about business, I wouldn't actually be exaggerating. Just like 80% of certified people know nothing. But if you take the MBA, and when you're in the MBA program, they're like, we're going to work on macroeconomics, and they give you a little project. There's nothing for you to, to stop you from doing what I did. We had a macroeconomics textbook. I don't know. It was 1,000 pages. I read 16 different macroeconomics textbooks while I was in that macroeconomics class and listened to audiobooks on my 200-mile drive to school every single day. Um, uh, or, yeah, it was three times a week. It was about 200-mile commute. And I listened to those books, read 16 macroeconomics textbooks, volunteered in class, volunteered in crafts projects. And you know what I learned? A lot of macroeconomics. So to me, school is basically, it opens the door and it says, you need to know something about this. And then go there, be like the cookie monster and thirst for knowledge. Let me grab this, let me grab this. Like the way Pac-Man would eat the dots or the cookie monster would eat the cookies. And knowledge and grab up and eat as much of that knowledge as you can. And then when you get out of that MBA program, you're a rock star. So for you, Craig, MBA first. Craig, you're already more technical than you need. You need more business, more sales, more leadership, more competence. And so MBA, 10 out of 10. CCNA, 5 out of 10. Linux for a cloud architect, 2 out of 10. Now that's a great question. Now if you wanted to be a cloud engineer, it would change a lot. If you wanted to be a cloud engineer, the Linux would be a 10 out of 10. And the CCNA would be a 7 out of 10. But I happen to know you're an architect. Good question. All right. Tariq says, thank you, Mike, for answering my questions earlier. Another quick question between Azure GCP and AWS. Which one have more jobs available? Which one leads to better paying jobs? Tariq, 98% of all organizations use more than one cloud. If you know the cloud, you know them all. If you learn to drive a car, does it matter if it's a Honda or a Toyota, a Chevy, a Ford, a Lexus, a BMW, a Rolls Royce, or a Bentley? You know how to drive. So Tariq, if you really learn the cloud, let's say you learn virtual machines, which is the basis of half of the computing on the cloud. KVM calls it a virtual machine. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, VMware calls it a virtual machine. AWS paid marketing people to call it Elastic Compute Cloud. It's the same silly virtual machine that was invented in 1999 by VMware. Google paid millions of dollars to come up with the name Compute Engine instance to their marketing department. And Azure calls it an Azure virtual machine and Oracle calls it a virtual machine. It's the same thing. Object storage, another 40-year-old technology. You can get it from Dell EMC as object storage. IBM used to sell it as object storage, too. You can get it from AWS, and they call it Amazon Simple Storage Solution, S3. You can get it from Google, and they call it cloud storage. You can get it from Microsoft, and they call it blob. Same thing. So if you really know the cloud and you learn the underlying technology, you can go from cloud to cloud to cloud, and it's nothing to you. If you get certified and you learn the name Google Cloud Bigtable, which happens to be their branded NoSQL database, all you know is the name of it. Now, Tariq, why can't I use Google Cloud Bigtable, Microsoft Cosmos, or Amazon DynamoDB in almost any architecture? Well, they're proprietary, and 98% of organizations are multi-cloud. So my choices become Apache Cassandra or MongoDB because they're the ones that work multi-cloud. They're better anyway, so you're not losing anything. So that's kind of the thing. So I want you to learn the cloud, not any cloud. You know, one year there may be more opportunities in AWS. The next year it's going to be more Azure. Google right now is a rounding error in the cloud space. Um, but they're going to be doing a lot more as more and more organizations go multi-cloud. Plus, there's certain things and practices that's of certain cloud providers that some people tend not to like. And that's causing a bit of a shift. There's transparency issues and how each of them describe their outages, which causes other people not to be happy. And guess what? There's personal preference. So I wouldn't worry about any of it. I'd worry about learning the cloud and you'll be good to go. 
Really great question. Yeah, it's really important just to focus on the cloud. I just read today, Mike, that starting Q1 of 2024, IBM cloud is going to go up 26%. I believe that. And uh, IBM is going to be in a, is a, in a huge position, not only from OpenStack, but their cloud, because IBM is one of the best, most trusted organizations in the technology space, as is Microsoft. They've been dealing with generations and generations. And, and most people don't understand the size of these companies. People think of Amazon and they think it's huge. Hmm. Amazon earned less than $2 billion last year. Microsoft earned $76 billion, which means in terms of actual business after all, profitability, Microsoft is more than 30 times more profitable than Amazon. And I'm not talking Amazon Web Services. I'm talking Amazon Web Services. I'm talking all of the retail sales with all of their sales and every other business owned by Amazon. So you're dealing with somebody, it's like a David and a Goliath, a lion versus a little lizard. So, I mean, and I love Amazon and I love Microsoft and I love Google. The Google is a huge company too, but you know, when we look at it, don't ever count out a Microsoft or an IBM that's got that kind of earnings. And that kind of footprint. One thing that I like to say about, we used to like to say about IBM, they go to their customers' weddings, their kids' college graduations. They were there at their kids' uh, christening or bris or whatever it was when they were born. And IBM has those kind of relationships in the business. They are trusted advisors and they are really good at what they do. Yeah. Yeah, they've been around a long time. My mother retired from IBM. So I, I come from a kind of a, a generation list of people who have had that exposure. And they, they've done some amazing things. And my first $1.1 billion architecture was a joint project with IBM. All right. So Progress asks if you can give a summarization of a cloud security architect pathway skill-wise. Okay, so I don't know what he means by pathway. So progress. First jobs my student get are either cloud architects, cloud security architects, or cloud network architects. There is no other job. What I mean by that is you don't learn to fly an airplane by being a flight attendant. You don't learn to be a doctor, for example, by working as a nurse first. You're learning different skills. So first job for my students as a cloud architect or cloud architect or cloud security architect. So I'm going to assume that's your first job because you got the right training. Now, what do you need to learn? If that's the question. First thing you remember, need to know as a cloud security architect, your job is to design, present, and sell a security solution. Design, present, and sell. And that means you've got to start with your client and you've got to assess the security risks for their business. Why does it start there? Well, it has to start with the security risk because I'm not going to spend a billion dollars to protect a $2,000 asset. So the first thing is quantifying the organization's risk. How many people do they have? What kind of people do they have? What's the average cost of a security breach per person? what levels of intellectual property the person has. And that means you need to have business acumen and business modeling skills because nobody wants to spend money on security and nobody's going to buy your stuff and then until you can quantify the security risk they have and show them your risk mitigation strategies cost less. Next, I'm going to start with the business skills first because where everybody goes wrong is they learn the tech and then they can't get hired because the business skills are at least important. This is a 60% business job. 40% tech job. Next thing, sales. If you can't sell, nobody will ever buy or use your architecture, or, and you won't even be able to sell or something getting hard. So sales. Next one is executive relevancy, CXO relevancy and CXO uh, and executive presence, which means what, how do you address the concerns of the chief information officer versus the chief information security officer versus the chief financial officer versus the CEO? I promise you, you do no architecture and sell it without talking to them, especially at the big leagues. So you've got to be there. And you also have the presence because you can't walk in and say, hi, I'm Mike Gibbs, the security architect. you got to be, hi, I'm Mike Gibbs. I'm here to help you. I'm your cloud security architect. Now, after that, presentation skills as a cloud security architect, you will be presenting every single day. And you will also be leading a team 
If there's a proof of concept, you're not going to be touching the tech, the engineer, the security engineers you bring with you will. And you're going to have to lead that team. So for the most part, that's your non-technical skills. Now, your technical skills are not engineering skills, they're architecture skills. So first, you need to design the end-to-end -end security for the business. What does that mean? What do their demilitarized zones need to look like? What is the remote access strategy? How is traffic coming in? What kind of next generation firewalls are we using? How many layers of next generation firewalls are we using? Do we need intrusion detection, intrusion prevention strategies? What's the security event correlation mechanisms and strategies we're gonna be using? What kind of vulnerability management needs to be integrated into the organization? What kind of storage encryption needs to occur? What kind of network encryption needs to incur? How do we uh, authenticate people and users to determine who they are, what they're allowed to do and track and audit things later? Do we need to create some decoy kind of things like some honeypots to create to get hackers trapped? What are we doing to trap that, to, to detect systems that are there? And what also, you'll have to understand how to do training of people because you may do security training to people you may have to uh, train people in anti-malware, anti-phishing, anti-social engineering campaigns. You'll have to figure out the anti-malware type strategies, the organization, the server hardening strategies for the organization, the storage protection strategies for the organization. And of course, you're going to have to help come up with a security policy, incident response procedures, and statements of work for the team that are going to ultimately build our solution. They're the skills to be a cloud security architect. We teach them, obviously, and that's why our students are getting hard constantly. It's a great job. There's an absolute critical demand for security architects and lots of them in the cloud environment. Now, it wouldn't hurt to get a security certification after you learned all these things. That security certification will be the icing on the cake to make you look good. Only certification that I know that's actually worth anything in the security world is the CISSP. Your security engineers will hate it because it doesn't go very deep. It's an architecture certification. Your hiring managers typically love them because it shows that you at least understand it from a business context point of view. Good question, Progress. All right, Robert asks, executive leadership styles. How do you guys see leadership style in the industry today? How are they changing or are they similar to the way they were a few years ago? Well, Robert, instead of worrying about which leadership strategies, because if you're a good leader, you know when to use an affiliative versus something that's more direct. What you really have to consider is how much have people evolved over the last several million years. Leadership is a lot about sales. It's about psychology. It's about emotional intelligence. We haven't changed that much. Now, our cultures have changed slightly, and we may have to have more cultural sensitivity or more cultural relevance, et cetera, et cetera. But the leadership style you choose doesn't change that much. There may be a time we need to use a situational leadership style. Okay, I'll give you an example. So we've got me, Chris, and Alonzo going to a meeting. They first talk about strategy. Ding, ding, ding. I take my turn. Then they talk about execution and getting the job done. And I say, please talk to Chris. He's an expert on that. And he's in charge for the remaining of that time. And then somebody says, Mike, how do we market this? And I'm like, please talk to Alonzo. Alonzo's in charge until that's done. And then in the end, it's back. Let's talk sales. And it goes right back to me. And that's called situational leadership. That's almost always appropriate. But, you know, if there's a fire, I'm going to take use a command and control. Alonzo, you get out right now. Chris, you get out. Uh, Lisa, you grab Cindy and get out. And I'm going to grab and make sure all of you are out. You know, so there is that. But that works, that command and control in an emergency. Now, Alonzo, I need you here at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Alonzo's going to look at me like I have four heads. He'll have a new job at IBM tomorrow, and I'll be lacking a chief marketing officer. But if it was an emergency, Alonzo would do it, and he'd be thrilled that I did that. So it's situational in what you need to learn, but people haven't changed that much, Robert. 
We have to connect to people's heart and people's soul and people's minds. And if you are authentic and you communicate well, even when you have to do tough things like a layoff or tough things like uh, have a hard conversation, people understand how you treat the person, how you act, how authentic you are. There's times in leadership we don't have to do the most fun and exciting things. And I also like to say I would never let anybody do something that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. Because if I wouldn't do it, I, I would, uh, wouldn't expect somebody else to do it. All right. Okay. Um, security architecture, are the solutions you sell managed by your company or the company you are selling to? That's a big question. You're saying manage, meaning that's another story. So if you work for a company like Deloitte, you might be designing the systems at Deloitte, and then it's going to be turned over to another team to build it. And after it's built, they can turn it into an internal operations team, or it could be an outsourced environment where they're going to manage it externally. So it all depends on where you work. For example, if you're a security architect, you're going to design the security, but you're never going to manage it. But I could be working, let's say I work for Pfizer, and Pfizer managed their own systems. I have no idea I didn't work for Pfizer. But I could be the cloud security architect that designs it at Pfizer. I work directly for the chief information security officer or the CIO, and I design it, and the security engineers build it. And then after the security engineers build it, it could kind of turn over to a network and security operations center and they manage it. That's considered management. A change needs to occur. A change request gets filed. It'll hit the architecture team. It'll hit the engineering team. And it'll go back to the operations and management team to go do it. But it could be an IBM strategic outsourcing thing where IBM says, we're going to manage everything for you. IBM designs it. IBM people build it. And then IBM people maintain it. All different departments, obviously. So it, it all depends on what the business model is, the company that actually designed it, and what the company wants. Obviously, if the companies manage it themselves, they have the most control. And if they outsource it, they can give it to somebody else and often do it at a lower cost. All right. So next question is currently our last question. So Ginka says, is it feasible to aim at becoming an engineer and an architect with the idea of getting hybrid roles, earning as both, if mm -hmm. such roles exist? Okay, so I'm going to try and give it to you. you. There is no such thing as a hybrid engineer and architect. If you go do both, you will be an engineer. You can't do both, and here's the reason. So Tyrone, I'm going to share something real quick. You just simply can't fly an airplane and keep the passengers in their seats at the same time. Because your perspective and what you have to do changes everything. So here's two photos that I actually took. Uh, Tyrone, if you can share these things. Show the first photo for me. Here's a photo I took in my backyard. And could you remove the Dingleman um, so people can see what they see here? Uh, Tyrone. So here you got a cute little squirrel in my backyard. It looks happy, doesn't it? The grass looks green and it's hanging out in a tree in my backyard. This is what an engineer would see. Why? The engineer must be zoomed in and focused on the work they are doing. So you can think the engineer is like a veterinarian working on the, on the squirrel right now. The architect has to focus on the business. They have to focus on every part of optimization in that business. And they can never focus on any one thing. They need to see the big picture. So here's what was really going on in my backyard. And the engineer couldn't see it because they were focused on the squirrel. Now, Tyrone, share this, please. This is really what was going on in my backyard. See that cute cat with the pointy ears and the tail? That's my cat, Cindy. My cat, Cindy, was thinking about eating that squirrel for lunch. Now, the engineer needed to be focused and zoomed in on that squirrel. 
the architect needs to be zoomed in because the architect might be thinking, you know, how do I keep the squirrel from attacking, being attacked by the cat? And that's the reason why. So, you know, there are roles where they hybrid them both, but they are engineering roles. And I want to kind of make it clear to you. It's a totally different set of skills. An architect is about design. An engineer is about build. An architect will spend 50 to 75% of their day giving presentations, writing documents, leading team meetings, facilitating meetings, doing executive briefings, and designing and responding to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs. You could spend 10, 12 hours a day doing just that. The engineer will spend eight hours a day working with Linux, working with a Terraform script, writing a Python script, writing a Bash shell script. And in the process, they can't do all the other stuff that architects do. As an architect, here's the process. Start with the company's executives and find the vision for the company. Now, here's the worst thing. If you're a techie, they won't give you the respect than if you're the business executive. And they're not even going to talk to the engineer. So when you say a hybrid role, it's always an engineer. And when you say a hybrid architect engineer role, it pays half of a pure architect role in general. So first, you're going to earn half the salary. And then you're going to do double the work. And you're not going to be able to do anything successfully. So if you see any implement with architect, run as fast as you can. So after we find out about the company's business guy, visions for the business, we then need to focus on the business. How does the business operate today? Routes to revenue, et cetera. And then from there, what else do we need to do? After we understand the company's business, we need to help figure out with, you know, how do we want to optimize the business to be run for the future? Which means we've got to baseline their current business architecture, design a new tech business architecture, do a gap analysis between where they are now and where they want to go. Now we've got to go look at their data architecture, for example. Data is an asset to the business. How does the business want to use data? How is the business using data? How might that business use data in the future to earn more? Because the architects focused on revenue things. Engineers focused on tech. So architects focus on that. So we've got to base on the data architecture. Figure the future data architecture for the future. Do a gap analysis. Now the technology architecture. What's the technology look like today? What's working? What's not working? Where are the pain points? What kind of new technologies do we need in the future to make the business operate the way we want it to do in the future? I okay, know. When this is done, because you wanted to understand why you couldn't do both, I wanted to make it clear. Now, after we do this, what do we need to do now? After we've got the design done, now we got to go figure out, you know, plan this thing. Who can build this? How many engineers do we need? How many cloud engineers? How many DevOps engineers? How many sys admins? How many cloud admins? How many cloud security engineers? How many DevOps engineers? How many software developers? How many project managers are going to manage this thing? We got to go look for planning and resources material. Then after we figure out this, we've got to go to all the stakeholders in the company and we've got to convince them to donate resources from their team or donate money for this and support the implementation. Then we got to go focus on building a governance strategy which people are going to be responsible for making sure this gets implemented in their department and implemented correctly and how it impacts the business. And then we've got to come up with change management strategies. Every time a change needs to occur, how are we going to do it? What needs to be done? Can we manage it through a change management cycle? Does it need another architecture cycle? So we're spending all day on this. We're never going to even think about touching the technology. Now, in one case, we're building business executive skills. In the other place, we're really building these hands-on technician kind of skills. It's why you don't see the person flying the airplane fix the engines. It's why you don't see the doctor in the office. You see the nurse that's actually sitting in the hospital. That's why you can't be a pilot and a flight attendant at the same time, a doctor and a nurse at the same time, and a cloud architect and a cloud engineer at the same time. Yeah. And if you do, and you have a job where they call it cloud architect and you're doing that, that it's a cloud engineering it. job. It's going to pay you half, and you're going to be and you're going to fail no matter what you do. Run. Because if I ask you to be a painter, a lawyer, and a physician, and a dog walker all at the same time, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. Yeah, run. <laughs> Chris said it best. If they want some sort of hybrid super ninja uh, engineering architect that can work weekends, patch things in the um, 
uh, in the middle of the night um, during the holiday season and add feature work, run for the hills because they know that there's no such thing as that job. They're not going to be able to afford that job. There's never going to be a uh, $180,000 architect slash and then they add $141,000 or $161 for that engineering for you to have this big payday. So, you know, Yinka, if you ever see that or you see or hear someone say that they've had that job, chances are they're not accurate or they didn't know what they were talking about or doing. Yeah, and Yinka, here's the other thing to remember. Business average salary with business acumen in the US, according to salary.com, is 558. Average engineering salary is about four hundred thousand dollars less than that. Spend your time on your business acumen. Spend your time on the things that give you more opportunities in life, not less opportunities in life. So tonight, please join us on our completely free how to win the interview webinar. We'll cover the webinar, uh, you know, interview training why it's so critical. We'll also talk a little bit about how we can help you, but we'll also give you some interview tips tomorrow. Please join us for the How to Become the Ultimate Cloud Architect. And, you know, in the, um, Tyrone will put it here, if you want to know how to become an architect and get your first cloud architect job, not only do I want you to come tomorrow, not only can I interview you or gauge you or assess your, your capabilities on the call, you can ask me face-to-face -face questions live, but, We'll tell you everything you need to learn and download the free architect job guide and the free architect webinar and see you tonight on our interview webinar. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. All right, everybody. Thank you all. Tyrone's got all those links in the chat box there for you. And uh, we're going to go get ready for our show tonight. See you all then. Or not our show, our webinar. Sorry. See you all then. Bye, everybody. <laughs>